Rotocraft Pro here with CW5 Ken Jones, uh, Apache pilot with the Utah National Guard. Ken, thanks for joining us today. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about the Apache, just real high level stuff. Um, so why don't you go ahead and start off by telling us a little bit about uh, your guard unit and what your mission is. Okay, um, I'm a, uh, a member of the Utah Guard and the unit that uh, I fly with is called 1st of the 211th Attack Recon Battalion. And it's, a, uh, it's based in West Jordan, Utah, near Salt Lake City. And uh, when we go to combat, we have 24 aircraft. Our mission is to be ready to provide uh, services to the ground soldiers when they're in country. So we're going to provide overhead cover. We're going to provide reconnaissance, security, those kind of things that would uh, help them survive. So our mission is to support the ground commander. OK, great. So now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the performance of the aircraft. So let's walk up here by okay. the uh, engine area. Let's talk about that. We just want like layman's terms, high level performance numbers. Uh, what, what kind of power plant uh, is it? Two it's, engine, right? It's a General Electric. It's a 701D. This particular is a 701D engine. It has somewhere around 2000 shaft horsepower-ish on each engine, so you're, you know, you're closing in on 4,000. They're very high performance engines. But that also varies, I know you're giving me a wide range because you have multiple variants of the Apache, right? How many right. variants of the Apache are there now? Well, we started off with A models, uh, very good aircraft, and then they moved to the Longbow, which brought some very unique characteristics uh, that has enhanced its capability. We have GPS with moving map, we have performance uh, data that's right there on our um, uh, multi-function displays, and it uh, just provides us a lot more situational awareness. Now, to get that, it costs about a thousand more pounds in gross weight, so you lose a little bit of performance capability for that situational awareness. Right, so you covered the Alpha model, the D Longbow, which that's what this aircraft this is. is. And yes. then there's a third variant that's out now? It's called the AH-64 Echo Guardian. It looks like a longbow. It has, you know, these kind of probes, but they've made some significant enhancements to it. They've reduced the weight a little bit. They've improved the drivetrain, so you can actually carry more of the weight that you used to with an alpha model. So we've made up for the weight issues, and we get better performance out of that aircraft. So what about, so you give me the horsepower of the aircraft. What about speed? What's V&E on this aircraft? The V&E is 197 knots, true airspeed. We can't go that fast. That would be more for like a dive onto the target. We typically cruise around 130 knots. We can maybe get up to 135, possibly 140, depending on what the density altitude is that day and how much we weigh. But uh, it's pretty consistent uh, in the 130-ish range. Now, speaking of density altitude, compare the mountains here. This is like a good place for training, right, in Utah. So compare the mountains here to maybe, say, in theater, what would be Afghanistan, right? Um, right now, we're sitting around uh, 4,500 feet, depending where you are in the valley. And that's a typical elevation for some of the fobs in Afghanistan. Some, there's some higher ones, uh, 7,500 feet. But those uh, things are, they, those DAs affect how much fuel you can carry to get out of that small area. But we end up in the big mountains like the ones we have behind us over here, and they go up 12, 13, 14,000 feet. And you may be operating at 9,000, 10,000 supporting ground forces, special operators or whatever, that are trying to, uh, you know, get a certain target uh, captured. And so you don't know what you're going to expect that day. Every day is different. It could be 4,500, it could be 13,000. And you've got technology that helps you interpret that data in flight, which we'll talk about in just a minute, right? We do. We have a performance page, and I'll show you that. All right, bit. great. So let's talk a little bit about weapon systems now on the aircraft. Okay. Um, my understanding is that you've got three main weapon systems. Can you tell us a little bit about those three? Yeah, we'll, we'll just start here because the rockets are right next to us. Um, we, each of these pods carry 19 rockets, and there's zones, and we can put point detonating, we can put IR illumination, we can put flechettes, we can put in um, different types of uh, you know, things that can help us do the job, and then we can select those in the cockpit. So it just depends on the mission that we're going to do, what we load, uh, and we have the ability to put roughly three different types on okay. at one time. So typically in Afghanistan. So that's your rockets. What, rockets. What's next? Um, this is a Hellfire rack. 
Okay. And this rack will hold uh, four missiles. They are basically, there's two types. There's laser guided, and we can read out, reach out to seven Ks, roughly, maybe a little farther, depending um, on the sensor. Um, and we have some fire and forget missiles. They're controlled by the radar, which is a very good thing about the longbow. A radar uh, sets up on top on those aircraft that are equipped, and it can scan the battlefield, and you have a fire and forget missile going downrange. Right. Okay, so we've got the rockets, we've got the hellfires, and what else do we got? We, we have this 30 millimeter chain gun, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very accurate weapon system. And um, essentially, when we're in combat, we'll carry around 330 rounds. We can carry up to 1,200, but what we elect to do is drop that big ammo pack and put on an extra internal fuel tank, which allows us to you know, get another 45 minutes of flight time. But 330 rounds is more than enough for what we need to do when we're in Afghanistan. We right. need the long legs for fuel. So it's a very excellent gun. You know, 625 rounds you know, per minute, essentially. And uh, we have a couple things that are connected to it. This is a very useful piece of equipment. It's an Islid laser. And it allows us to, uh, we know where the gun is pointing at. We can point out targets to the ground commander. And we say, okay, we have visual friendly. We have tally target. We're going to put our Islid laser. Is that the target? Yes, that's the target. You're clear to fire. So we use it for identification of, uh, of enemy targets. Okay, great. So three main types of weapon systems on the aircraft. And for those that aren't familiar with military aircraft at all, I see you've got two seats in the helicopter forward and aft. Mm -hmm. Which one's the pilot in command? Is this the pilot in command? This the gunner? Who sits where and who does what? The better way to look at it is the person who's flying the aircraft most of the time is in the back seat. And then the person who's going to manipulate the weapon systems primarily is in the front seat. Both seats can fly. Both seats can shoot. In our unit, normally, the pilot in command sits in the back and we put young guys in front. But on some missions, we may put two experienced guys in if they're really complex missions. And it just depends, you know, what seat that pilot command wants to fly that day. So I have done some missions as a pilot command in the front seat, but most of mine are in the back seat. So Ken, let's talk a little bit about the technology that's in this aircraft. Can you point out some of the high technology points of the, uh, of the aircraft? This one is what we call the MTADS. It's a modernized uh, target acquisition designation system. And we have a FLIR portion and we have a day -tip uh, day TV portion and there's lasers and there's laser spot trackers in and um, and we also have what we call the PIMVIS which is the pilot's night vision system and these essentially follow your head that we bore sight our uh, helmet to the aircraft and as you know then we're able to move the sensors with our head and and what's really important about that is that this gun down here it actually will follow your helmet if you select the gun. So we decide that we see a target at two o'clock. We'll look at two. There's some crosshairs. We'll put that onto the target and uh, you're able to engage pretty quickly. It's a very fast weapon system. So you have, you have the ability to control between whether or not you want it to be to follow the pilot's helmet or the gunner's helmet or manually move yes. it. Away. Now the backseater, this is for the backseater, and he always moves it with his helmet. The front seater has the choice of taking the TADS and either moving it by the helmet or going to line of sight TADS, which allows him to use a thumb force controller, and we can zoom in a couple hundred fields of view and get make something you know four miles away look real big and decide if that's a friend or a foe and go through our you know our rules before we actually you know pull the trigger so from an from a vision enhancement standpoint you've got nvgs mm -hmm. you have the flur forward looking infrared and then you also have a daytime camera that allows you to zoom in beyond your human line of sight exactly otherwise we would have to get too close so we get great standoff with this sensor right here and that's the main purpose of it is to is to identify targets at a long distance or if you need to to use it for close and flying what's the maximum range this this is going back to the weaponry but what's a max range that you would be engaging the enemy at it, it depends on the mission you know, if you're in Afghanistan, a lot of times you're underneath 2,000 meters, maybe 1,000 meters. If you were to go against a more robust type of uh, enemy, you might be standing off six, seven, possibly eight kilometers to, you know, engage based on what the threat's going to do. So there's a little bit of situational 
you know, dependency on it. Right. So Ken, let's bring it inside the cockpit. There's a lot of technology in the cockpit that allows you to navigate and do other functions of your job. Tell me a little bit about some of that. Well, before you ever hop in the cockpit, you got to go to a computer and load your mission onto a data cartridge. And we take this data cartridge and we just insert it, you know, in to the uh, into this holder right here. And when we power up, it loads our mission data to our moving map. Now, our moving map is mainly driven by GPS, but we have inertial navigation systems that help it. And what we get is very good situational awareness. We can have uh, tactical charts, we can have civilian sectionals, we can have L charts. There's a lot of things that you can pull from that you can look at here and we load them onto the map along with digital train elevation data so that we get a 3D capability too. Now, um, this information goes in and then we use it to get to the target the most expedient way or to help the ground commander. Um, there's just a lot of things that it will help us do. Now, also one of our pages is the performance planning page and it gives us our current max power, our current V&Es, all the things that would be critical for us to know while we're flying based upon your gross weight and your density altitude. And then the helmet. The helmet is, uh, is pretty neat because these little sensors on the side right here, they pick up this right here. This technology is an IR beam that hits that little sensor and there's four of them. And there's another device on the other side that also uh, sends out these IR beams. They just call them SSUs. But this helmet picks up the IR from the, from the broadcasting, and then it knows where your helmet is in the cockpit and drives the weapons. So it drives the gun to be where you want it to be, or where you're looking if you're going to shoot rockets, or whatever it is that you want to do. So the helmet is an awesome piece of technology. We have MBG capability here, in addition to um, the FLIR, uh, which mounts like this, essentially. Okay. And, uh, and so this sets on our eye you know, and rotates into the helmet like that. So, um, you know, so for me, when I'm flying, it, set, it sets here like this, but it mounts in here. So I have the option of either being infrared or I can put MVGs on. Okay. And I use them as I need to. That's called a monocle, right? This is called the HDU, the Helmet Mounted Display System. And uh, it's a little monocle that you can adjust it. We, we get it perfectly fitted to our face. And so, um, you know, the helmet, and siding system is a very key integral portion. So what about the comms? You got quite a few comms in this aircraft, right? We do. We control it right here for volumes and then we can see it on this display right here. And so we can put a primary freak and a standby freak. We have essentially a Victor radio. Uh, like 122.7, if that's we have uniform frequency, we have two FM radios, and we have the ability to be SATCOM or high freak, one or the other. And um, the nice thing about these uh, uh, UHF and FM radios, we can be frequency hopping, and we can also be scrambled. They call that cipher. So we have the ability to jump frequencies and scramble the frequencies and that keeps it where it's pretty hard to intercept what we're talking about. So it's a very good communications and easy to work and uh, you know we do well with it. I'll tell you what, why don't you hop up in the front and let's take this thing around the patch. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> yeah, I could do it one time and then that would be uh, if you retirement. Be, yeah, it's retirement time. I could get away with some once. Uh, That's about it. So, Mr. Jones, I really appreciate your time today and for sharing with us a little bit about the Apache and what you guys do here with the Guard. Well, thanks for coming out and taking the time to, you know, be interested about what we're doing and you know what we what kind of service we provide to the nation. Well, thank you.